Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, welcome to Out and About on Think Tech Live streaming network series. I'm your host, Winston Welch, and I'm delighted you're joining us today where every other week we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any views or opinions expressed by me are strictly my own and are not connected with any organization I might be affiliated with. Joining me today in the studio is our guest, Michael Goyloyu, Jr., grassroots coordinator from Compassion and Choices, the nation's oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit organization committed to improving care and expanding options for end of life uh, options, uh, end of the, the end of life. And uh, today we're going to talk about some current legislation going through Hawaii and HB 2739 and issues surrounding this, which are not always clear cut and very passionate, I think, on both sides. So with that, I would like to welcome you to the show today, Michael. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, well, you know, it, and thank you for coming down and you're a uh, grassroots coordinator of this organization. So tell me about that. How did you get involved with this and, um, and why did you get involved with it? I've always supported uh, medical aid and dying. It's been something as far back as I can remember, and it's been a it's been a privilege to work on this. I was I was asked to come on a year ago in January um, to help them. With then it was SB eleven twenty nine that went through the legislature, and so we were um, hopefully optimistic last year. We've seen the bill get farther this year than we've ever seen it before. So. I got involved because it matters. People's choices should have control over their life, especially for those the terminally ill. They should have a say in how they leave this planet. And so, uh, grassroots coordinator is your official title. There, mm -hmm. what does that mean that you do as a grassroots coordinator? I reach. I work with our volunteers, our many wonderful hundreds of volunteers across the state and supporters. I also do outreach and uh, to organizations to see if we can get their support to come on board and. Uh, make sure that they know when and where to testify and uh, to come out down to and engage their legislature because every, that seems to be the, high, the biggest hurdle whenever advocating for any issue is making sure that people understand how they can reach out to their legislators the most effectively. Yeah, I think we, t we talked about that here a couple weeks ago when we had the Hawaii uh, Cannabis Alliance mm -hmm. on here and just the, you know, spent quite a bit of time going through the rather um, complex steps that a bill goes through to become a law and mm -hmm. all the areas it can be killed in or smothered in or just uh, or advance in mm -hmm. and, and how how that whole process is and I think it's rather opaque to uh, ordinary people and even people that know about it y there's just a lot of different boxes that you got to go through to get any bill mm -hmm. there but the main thing you're saying is if you want your voice to be heard you got to be aware you got to follow the issue you got to support the organizations that uh, you believe in whatever the cause is and then look to them for guidance and also maybe give them some guidance too on the other way exactly and just trying to break down the barriers between the average citizen being able to reach out to their legislators because uh, Unlike other states, we have some really open doors here in Hawaii. Uh, how to get uh, get your testimony in, be able to reach out to your legislators. Um, uh, when people come to visit from the mainland, they're all they're always surprised that there are no security gates they have to go through at the Capitol. That they can just walk in and walk into a legislator's office. Um, it's a little more difficult for our neighbor island folks, but there's still the the direct website, the calling in. Uh, unfortunately, I'm hopeful one day we will actually have video be able to testify by video for our neighbor island um, members. Well, friends. maybe that's that's next after this one. So yeah. I was just looking and fall, I've been following this issue for a while and like you as a, as a youngster, um, I was, uh, had joined the Great Panthers, which was advocating for senior citizen rights back when I was 18 or 19, mm -hmm. because I realized I'm gonna be a senior citizen someday. I want the, the curb cuts there. I want social security to be in place. Mm -hmm. I want, uh, you know, Medicare and Medicaid and all of that to be there. I want our society to value all of its members mm -hmm. um, in a way when when I arrive, I'll, I'll be there already. So I can understand that. And also, I, I remember um, either giving or so, somehow probably supporting the Hemlock Society, mm -hmm. which may be a precursor to this organization. Are, were, were you aware of them? The Hemlock, yes, I, we are. They, uh, they were around before uh, Compassion and Choices, uh, but they we di we differ on um, some of the when it comes to the choices, but 
that like it is that you're going to have many different voices working towards the same goal. Mm -hmm. And we, if there's um, besides Compassion and Choice of Hawaii, we have Death with Dignity or, or Society, and there are other different societies out there or organizations working towards the same goal. So okay. and it's been really nice to be working with them, uh, getting to know all of them, as well as the diverse. Uh, the diversity of our support. It's um, putting together this coalition has been one of the, my happiest moments of, as it were, as, an, as a community activist and community organizer. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll get to that in a minute, all sure. the, the different organizations that you do work with, mm -hmm. because you're right, it's not just one organization mm -hmm. or one group doing this. This is a large number of voices working together on a, on a sensitive and difficult topic, which mm -hmm. is around death and something that we don't really deal with well in our society at all. Um, I, I, I wonder how many people even fill out an advanced care directive um, in the hospital. Yeah, and, that, and that's something else that we do. Uh, we're not just advocating for medical aid and dying, we're also uh, making sure people know about advanced directives and they know how to let their doctors know what they want and their family members. So we engage them in making those uh, tough decisions now so that their family doesn't have to, should something come up. That uh, empowering people to understand their choices at the end of life. And really, I think what we need to be looking at is end of life options way before we reach the end of life. Exactly. I, I think we, we have a little glimpse of that on our driver's license card when we can say, do you want to be an organ donor? Yeah. But that's about it. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me like kids, yeah, kids, mm -hmm. getting their driver's license. I was 14 when I got my first driver's license. And there's not a sense that you're, that you're going to expire at some point in life. But just like uh, everybody that's ever lived on this planet, you have an expiration date. Mm -hmm. And we don't really think like that when we're young, but it seems to me like we should have some, you know, something beyond that, even as kids where, you know, I, I remember in seventh grade, I took a, something called like death and dying class, and they actually mm -hmm. took us to a morgue, which was very advanced, oh, yeah. I think, in those, in those days. That was, yeah, seventh grade, and I always thought this is... Um, a special experience that we have. I think we could have gone to a, a botany you know, mm -hmm. lab as well, but you know, this was just a different thing. And I, I just realized in er this is an area that, are, that we don't really have a lot of experience in. And so when people are faced with these choices, they're suddenly overwhelmed mm -hmm. by everything. And you're looking at you know, maybe your parents or your, your own life mm -hmm. or you, uh, even a, a child's life. And, and it can all be just too much all at the last minute. Mm -hmm. So um, how does your organization step in with this and help with with these choices and this education? Well, one of the things we do is we are we're always looking for uh, tabling opportunities to go out there. Like we've, we've done the senior fair, we've begun to, uh, we do conferences, uh, but it's, uh, we have some really great resources on our website at compassionchoices.org about making sure that starting these conversations, and because there's something, no matter how diverse you are from everybody else, whatever makes you different than everything, everybody else is that we all have one thing in common, we're all gonna die. And so that making sure that you can put your life in your own hands, if you um, if you ever get uh, even if, if you never get a terminal illness, that you know that you can have say in how you are treated medically, um, should anything arise. And I think that's one thing about your organization is it just doesn't focus on. Uh, you know, aid in dying, it's just the whole uh, range of, of things. So you can go there and, f and find an advanced care directive or uh, just even documents on how to begin the conversation with your loved ones mm -hmm. or even what to think about. Yeah, and it's about having the conversation. But, and that's the one thing that we, we want to make sure everybody knows is that medical aid in dying isn't for everybody. We, and that's why it's a considered, it's a choice. But there's also a lot of other choices out there to making sure that your will and your wishes are done. Wish it when it, because we were talking about your life and your medical care. Mm -hmm. Because nobody should be making those choices or decisions for you but you. Nobody should be making those choices for you but you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so your your organization, which is Compassion, A N D Choices dot org, correct. We can find a whole uh, range of materials on there. Exactly. Uh, so this bill that's coming out, I just saw on the the advertiser or the Star Star ad. Heisers, our newspaper, that the medical aid and dying bill heads for the full Senate vote here. So this was Friday's paper, and it looks like it looks like this has cleared its last major hurdle at the state legislature, paving a way for the full vote by the Senate. So the House Judiciary Committee voted four to one to advance this bill. Mm -hmm. And now it goes on to the um, to the full Senate. Yep. 
then what happens after that? Then, um, as long as the Senate hears it before 10 days before the end of session, the governor then has 10 days to sign, veto, or allow it to come law without his signature. Um, but we, so we are hopefully optimistic that the bill will be uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll be getting notice soon that the Senate will be going to a full vote, and that's when they they all get to debate it if they have anything they want to say on the issue or not. Um, it's open to the public. We um, if you want to come down and support us, we sure would like to have everybody down there with us when the bill comes up. Um, but if you, we have a Facebook page and we'll put out we put notices there. But yeah, so this is. Uh, the symbol of bill that we talked about, SB 1129, passed the Senate 22 to 3 last session. So we're hopefully optimistic that it, uh, we will pass this last hurdle and the governor will then deem fit to sign it into law. Well, if it, if it passed last session, then 23 to 2. 22 to 3. 22 to 3. So it passed, and then what happened? It went over to the House, and there were, uh, there were some con concerns in the House and the health, com health Committee, and that's where it got deferred. And so... Um, we, they, that's why well, we, between uh, last session and now, they, we've had conversations. We kept the conversation alive, like by doing the senior fair. And the one thing that we heard loud and clear, well, even at the senior fair, is that people were like, "Why didn't it pass?" And we're like, uh, "We don't know." There was there there are many different things that got that caused it not to pass last session, and we're just really grateful that it's gotten so far. This is as far as any medical aid and dying bill has ever gotten. And so we can see the finish line, but we take no vote for granted. We take, we, and we encourage people to reach out to their senators and let them know, and hopefully, and let them know that they support it and why. Because it's that kind of interactive, inter interpersonal communication that we have that really has helped move this bill forward. And we poll at 70 to 80 percent support, depending on which polling you're looking at. And has this already passed the House then? Yes, it's done the full House. Okay. We had a five and a half, was it five and a half, five and a half, eight, hour, almost six hour hearing in the House. It was a joint committee hearing. And so everybody, and then the, it passed the House, uh, let's see, was it, I'm going to say 33 to uh, 18. So a little bit more contentious in the House. Mm -hmm. And then when this, so when is this actually going to come up? You, it, we don't know exactly? We don't know. Uh, the re we're waiting for the report to be issued by, from the committee. Uh, they voted on Friday, so uh, the report can hit any day now. And they have, well, after the report hits the uh, hits the floor, it has to sit there on the floor for 48 hours before they can do a vote, and that's the that's the that's the law. So it could come up any time, even this week. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then after that, it goes to the governor. It goes directly to the governor, and he has 10 days to uh, sign, veto, or let become law without a signature. And he's indicated that he would sign this. He has indicated, he's given us every indication that he would sign it by the fact that he submitted testimony in support of it, and he has uh, made sure that a member of his staff has been at every hearing to let them know. Okay, and so what we're talking about is this bill taking effect for mentally competent residents who are at least 18 years old, have been given six months or less to live, would be eligible under the bill to request uh, lethal medication uh, to choose to end their own lives. Two health care providers would need to confirm the patient's diagnosis, prognosis, competence, and that the request is voluntary. Before any medication is prescribed, the patient would need to receive mandatory counseling from a psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinical social worker. We're talking today with uh, Michael Goylayu from uh, Compassion and Choices. We're going to take a short break here. My name is Winston Welch, and this is Out and About on Think Tech Live Streaming Network Series. We'll be back in a moment. This is what the hey, how come he gets to go in? He's a service dog. Well, I could get a vest too. You're not even a service dog. He's trained to assist his owner. Well, I can do whatever he can do. Wow, did he just open the door? Yep. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that either. He's trained for over two years to become a service dog. Man, I wish I could be a service dog. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. <music> Thank you.
It's, they, they allow the state to make their mind. Hey, well, uh, we're back. We're live. I'm Winston Welch. This is Out and About on Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. We're talking with Michael Goloyo Jr., grassroots coordinator from Compassion and Choices. And it's legislation that's currently working its way through the legislature on uh, end of life issues. Uh, this bill is Senate Bill. House Bill 2739. I'm sorry, House Bill 2739, okay, but it is in the Senate now. Yes. Okay, so how does that read when it's in the Senate? It's okay. still House Bill. It's still called House Bill. Because that's the vehicle that, uh, so you have Senate bills, SB, and uh, House bills, HB, and they they keep that number through their entire process, no matter which chamber they're in. Okay, and I can, I can see this is, this is a sensitive issue, because mm -hmm. we're talking about people's lives ending, and for the first time in well, legally in our history, the option to be able to decide the t the timing of your own departure on your own terms if you have a terminal illness. Exactly. Now, what other states and countries have laws like this? Oregon's the one that's had it the longest. Twenty, we're going on twenty years there. Uh, California passed it a year ago, so we, they just had their one year anniversary this past October. Um, and then you have Colorado, Washington D.C. And I think I get on something else. Washington, maybe? Washington State, yes. Washington State? Yes. So it's just a few states at this point. What mm -hmm. other nations are, are have uh, issues with this, if, you, if you're aware? Um, uh, Holland, and there's some other ones that maybe. do have it. They have, have, have enacted this. Maybe Switzerland or something like that, yeah. Belgium does yeah. too, if I'm not mistaken. But so we're at the vanguard of this right now. Mm -hmm. um, and. Okay. Well, Oregon was the vanguard of this, and, and okay. they, yeah, so they they paved the way. And uh, the one thing that we want to make sure everybody knows that it has never been abused or misused in Oregon. There has been no cases of anybody ever being coerced into using uh, accessing medical aid and dying in uh, Oregon over the 20 years. And so this argument from our um, opposition saying it's a slippery slope that uh, that I've. A, it's not true, and B, it's just there's no nothing. No, there's nothing to back up their claims on that. So tell us about Oregon, maybe since we have the most data on that, you probably can reference that the most. What numbers of, of, of people are we looking at? I think Oregon probably has, I'm guessing, about two million people, or maybe twice the population of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So we can just figure out the math from there. Let's just say two to make the math easy, or maybe three, because we probably have a one and a half million mm -hmm. in the state. How many people a year are actually applying for this, and what's the process? Is, is our bill similar to theirs? Our bill actually has more safeguards than theirs, because uh, the, they don't have a requirement for uh, the the uh, meeting with the psychologist or psychiatrist and making sure that, and the reason that's in there is to make sure that people aren't going that after getting a diagnosis and because they're depressed. Um, because when you get a terminal illness diagnosis, that can cause depression, and we understand that. And so there's that safeguard there. Um, but for the rest of it, basically, our bills basically very much uh, mirror each other. And so with that extra step, we believe that this bill, it will be one of the, uh, that it is one of the most protective ones of people's rights as well as safeguards to ensure that it's not being misused. Now, how many people a year in Oregon are actually up I guess requesting the medicine uh, in advance. Okay, if I don't hold me to these numbers, if sure. I remember correctly, it's around 200, 250 people a year. Okay. That and of those that request it, only 10% um, actually, after getting the prescription, actually fill out the prescription, get the prescription filled, and then that, of that, um, where you're looking at even a lesser number of people actually go through with it um, because it's more of a. Um, What's the, what's the right word? Safeguard or um, they feel that they've now have their life in their own hands. So it's, it's even if to know it's there is a comfort mm -hmm. for somebody who's been diagnosed. And again, you have to be terminally ill, mentally competent, above the 18 years of age, and um, no sign of depression and they're depressed. Well, I would imagine that people are a little bit depressed if they get a terminal diagnosis. <laughs> that, 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 that part actually seems a little bit uh, silly to me because you, if, you, if you're there, you might be depressed. But let's say, okay, you got that safeguard built yeah. in and you make it through um, but, everything. But I also, so this gives people a measure of control at the end where there's really not a lot of control that they're mm -hmm. looking at, yeah. um, you know. That's, I guess, fundamentally what it comes down to. And the option, at least, to exercise that, even though 90% or maybe 85, mm -hmm. something like that, don't. Yeah. So, and, because uh, when you have a terminal illness and everybody's like, oh, palliative care, hospice, that they're able to, but 
requiring somebody to sit there and without this law, uh, requiring somebody with a terminal illness that's living through pain day in and day out to that you'd be requiring them to live through that pain because there's only so much palliative care can do um, to handle the pain. And, it, and then it comes also a as it, someone's decide, deciding how much they can take by pain or dignity when they lose the, the ability to control their bowels. Uh, as we had, and so we're heading into, um, again, it's a personal choice. There's nothing in here that requires a doctor to participate, nothing requires a terminal ill patient to do it. It's, again, it's the terminal ill patient's decision. So if you're a doctor, you can say, I really don't want to be involved in this. Mm -hmm. This is not, I, I, okay. like it, I, just like abortion. Yeah. You have doctors that perform them, you have doctors that do not. Okay. And so there's nothing in this bill that requires a doctor to participate. Uh, so there's a lot of people that have testified for and against this bill. Um, it seems, it's interesting because because the Office of the Governor supported it, the Department of Health, the Attorney General, uh, the American Psychological Association, even the Longshoremen's Union, which is interesting, uh, the F it looks like AFL-CIO, um, a lot, the Democratic Caucus, and uh, a lot of others in here, the LGBT Caucus, the Kupuna Caucus of the Democratic Party, um, Death with Dignity, Compassion and Choices, Friends of Civil Rights, the Hawaii Martin Luther King Jr. Coalition. It's it's very interesting mix of choices. On the other half, you have uh, the other side. You have you know uh, I think what you typical St. Francis and the Hawaii Catholic Conference. Um, you have uh, the Disability Rights uh, Education and Defense Fund um, Association with People with Disabilities, which I can understand because we've had some history in the past. Uh, well, we go back to the Nazis mm -hmm. and they said, okay, people with disabilities. It's yeah. Uh, that's it. So how, how are we addressing this and making sure that that's not something that's uh, included in this or would even be considered and how, how do we get protect those people? Well, the, a disability is not a terminal illness and mm -hmm. so just because you have a disability is, doesn't mean you cannot access this this law if the only thing you have is, and I've had these gut-wrenching discussions and heart-wrenching with it because they've been fed lies, which it, it is not even, a, you can, we can have differences of opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Yeah. And there is nothing in the bill that would allow somebody with a disability to even ask their doctor to, uh, for access to medical aid. Not Unless they had a had terminal illness. illness. You have to have the, if you, yeah, anybody with a terminal illness, six months or less to live, then can, if you have a disability or not. But just because you have a disability, you cannot access the okay. medical aid and dying, and, and I and I and it and it's been it, it's just been one of my biggest frustrations, and is that they would be willing to lie to their their supporters to get their support on the uh, to go against this. And I'm like, if you you can have a difference of opinion for whatever reasons, and we see that there's a there's some religious groups in there that are against it, but we also have religious groups on our side that support it. So that's what I was going to say is there's probably religious groups have have, have team, uh, ended up on both sides of this discussion. So maybe I think is what happens a lot in our societies today is you have um, how did. Um, uh, Kelly, uh, Kellyanne Conway put alternative facts or um, yeah. something along that. So, you know, one of the the, the things that they're worried about is uh, elder abuse. That you're going to force you're going to force grandma to die because you're going to inherit her her money. And so um, you're going to say, here, sign here, grandma. Uh, um, I find it laughable. Actually, I, find, I almost find it disgusting that they that's what they go to. And I'm like, what kind of family are they coming from where they would even think of that? Um, just because you're old doesn't mean you have eternal illness, therefore you can't access it. Um, and that we should be, and they keep on saying, oh, we're caring about the elders. But I find it funny that we never see them at the Capitol when we actually have bills up before that would be protecting, making sure there is an elder abuse. And we have, and over the years, uh, I find that our opposition never seems to be there at those hearings. And they, when they're talking about disabilities, it's protecting those with the, the disabled community, they're not at the hearings that we actually, uh, for like HB uh, 1489, that would actually ensure non-discrimination against the disabled community. So these are probably, and you think there's enough safeguards in there. Mm -hmm. You got a couple doctors coming in, social workers. I'm sure they pull the person aside as, apart from their family or whoever's in the will. Mm -hmm. and I noticed in the documents themselves it says at least one of these people signing this, the witness cannot be 
related to you, cannot be a member of your will, cannot be a, a, a member of the healthcare facility. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of safeguards built yes. into this. Um, so it's, but I, I, I want to acknowledge that these people have a real fear of this. And so maybe as time goes by and they see results that, that are, the fears are not coming to play. Mm -hmm. um, I understand their, their idea that life should be lived to the very last second, but given our modern technology and the way that we're able to prolong lives in ways that we simply didn't have 10 years ago, 20, 100 years ago, mm. that this is something that's, um, you know, on the other spectrum and wh where we're giving people a, a right to choose mm. uh, whether or not how they want to control the end of their lives. And we're not talking huge numbers of people, but a very passionate topic here. Mm. Um, so what do you think, and we're not talking of any problem with palliative care, your organization completely sports palliative of care, we do. Uh, hospice, mm -hmm. uh, and and you want to see people have the best outcomes at the end of their lives. And then, yeah, that, that, they, that, that they choose, what they, they, they make those decisions for themselves. It's not their family making it for them, it's not their doctor making it for them, that it's the terminally ill patient being able to choose what's best for them, and everybody else as well, because that's what advanced directives are there for, is to making sure that you have control of your life at the end of life, and that um, there are a lot of options out there. If you want to do hospice, if you, uh, DNR, do not resuscitate orders, are, are um, people think that's all there is. There's actually, you can actually say how much medical care you're willing, you want, should you be in an accident. So are we looking at death tourism coming to Hawaii? No, you have to be a resident of Hawaii. No, there is no death tourism when it comes to any of the um, medical aid and dyings in the country because you have to be a resident. Okay. And so when people, uh, one of the arguments was, oh, you don't have to make it law here, they can go to Oregon to take advantage of it. And I'm but like- Oregon probably has a similar law. They do have a similar law. And when somebody's terminally ill, telling them they have to travel 3,000 miles away from their family to a a um, access medical aid and dying is, is there's no compassion yeah. and, in that at all. And it's, uh, you know, I think about Logan's Run, right? Mm -hmm. There's, we're not gonna have, when people turn 30 years old, their, their little lumber starts flashing and they, they get to go get their pill. Nope, because okay. it's nothing about age, it has to do solely with terminal illness. And so we're respecting as, as much as possible the individual as he or she approaches the end of his or her life mm -hmm. and, and just making full use of those options. And so this, this House bill, which is now House Bill, uh, 2739. 2739 will be popping up sometime. We can go to your website, CompassionAndChoices.org, for more information, or your Facebook page. What would that be? Compassion and Choices Hawaii. Is that, that they'll give you the hear when the comes up for the hearing, or not a hearing. I'm sorry, the third reading, which is the last and final vote in the Senate. We will put the notice out there, and um, then. Once it becomes law, we can look at access, nope. and helping people know that how to gain access and use it, when because it will not go into effect until should the Senate pass it and the governor sign it into okay. January first, twenty nineteen. Okay, and I think it's important for all of us, uh, no matter who we are, to make sure that our affairs are up to date. Make sure that your wishes are known with your family members, regardless of what those wishes are. There's no agenda here. It's just making sure that you have control of what you want. So. Make sure you have your, your documents out there. Talk with your family, talk with your doctor, talk with these great organizations out there that are on, on all sides of the issue so that you can be the most informed person uh, of your life because it's your show, you're the director, producer, writer, and star. So we really appreciate you coming here today, Michael. Well, thank and, you for having me. Um, we will come back again another time and see how, if this passes, how we might implement that and talk about other things, about maybe some of the documents and what we might do to be responsible oh, people. Oh, totally, we'll definitely be more, uh, either myself or someone else from the organization will be more than happy to come back to make sure people understand access. Okay, well thank you so much. So uh, unfortunately, as always, it goes very fast. We are out of time and I'm gonna have to wrap it up here. I am Winston Welch, this is Out and About on Think Tech Live Streaming Network series, and today I have been talking with Michael Goloyu Jr., mm -hmm. grassroots coordinator from Compassion and Choices, the nation's oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit organization committed to improving care and expanding options for the end of life. Thank you so much, and we'll see you here next time. Aloha.